Hello? Hey, can you hear me? I think you're muted. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just turning my speakers off, otherwise it's going to be a feedback loop. Cool. How are we doing? Oh man, so much stuff is happening. Just had a, an hour and a half long call with Wout and Metri on all things yeah, like sustainability. I was watching you call with researcher the 20 minute call you had with the psychology researcher mm -hmm. everyone it was pretty interesting but it was very much like how i've just looked at my part before about yeah you, so you have some device, noise but... like a hum or... it's like alien noises Now it's muted. Oh, one, two, one, two, one, two. perfect. One, two, one, two, one, two. Yep. Nice. Yeah, it was an interesting call. And, you, you know, I, I once again tried to bump into different people and ideate the, the directions. Yeah, you've got to conceptualize it. You've got to end the day. Um, a generalizable tool needs to be understandable from multiple dimensions. The more there different researchers we can bump into, the more we're going to get a better rounded picture. Hi, Derek. Hi, Isaac. Hi. How are you all? Hi. Good. Anyway. Good. Been a bit of a crazy week. week. Yeah. Been a bit of a crazy week. <laughs> crazy week indeed. I I actually think I I had the week of the longest calls so far, and all super meaningful. Yesterday. Um, me, Derek, Mitri, and Wout had a call on reciprocity and covering basic needs, be it for like, you know, Corona Y community or creating a model that can work beyond. And it was fascinating. I'm still processing uh, and digesting the concepts that we talked through. I think I'm going to post it in general after this call, just, you know, be, because it's, it's very interesting content. No, I think we had a great, great exchange. And uh, look, there's an amazing opportunity in front of us. So uh, we have to think outside the box and uh, look at what Corona Y is achieving. It's just uh, unique. So let's try to create an environment to sustain it, let's say beyond actually its initial impetus. And I think the call of yesterday was a great, uh, let's say, first step in that direction. And uh, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, especially since we start from like basic needs, basic security, like monetary, like barter economics. And then we somehow ended up with understanding that the key thing that we should start from is the contribution tracking and basically understanding who is doing what and how, you know, that relates to the whole. And that's when, uh, you know, I mentioned that project that we kicked off was Yason called uh, Golden Journal. Um, did we add you, Tyler, to it? Yeah, yeah, I got dropped into it. Honestly, like I've, I've, I've not been able to digest everything that's been added to my palate recently. I've been like, I, ever, I don't even know why. Andrea, I've watched the call about. Hi, Andrea. It's nice to see you again. Hey, welcome hey. back. Thank back. you. <laughs> 
I'm sure there's lots to catch up on, so I'm just going to listen, but it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, trust me, it doesn't matter if you were away for, for two months or you were away for a week. It, the, the, the it's nev it never gets better. <laughs> it never gets better. It just gets crazier. It's like, in some ways, it feel, I don't know, I obviously I've not done it yet, but I feel like it'd probably be easier if being away for a bit longer because you wouldn't feel like the pressure to catch up after 12 hours like you do. Honestly, I go away for 12 hours, I'm like, why has everything changed? I've already slept. Why is nothing stood <laughs> still for just five minutes? <laughs> oh. I mean, um, we've had. A, it feels like it's been quiet this week, but I think it's just lots of discussions have happened outside of my eye, eye line. Yeah, outside of my eye line, which makes it even more frustrating because they get dropped as like full ideas when you don't even see where they've come from, <laughs> and you've got to kind of digest it and work out what's been discussed and why and what the point of it is, all in one big lump rather than like seeing a little bit of a gem, you know, like a, a nugget of an idea that a few people discuss over and you can see a where spark. the germinates yeah. from. If you just yeah. get this like bang, I'm like, where has this even arrived from? <laughs> yeah, you, fully you baked won't... idea. Where did it appear? It's just appeared on my horizon. It's strange. You can't even imagine my surprise when I posted that literature review uh, product request for team assembly, and then Bianca came back to me with a spreadsheet with all the potential candidates uh, for for different roles, and I was like, wait what like how did you make it happen and apparently we have a crm and we have the taxonomy that andrea created like three months ago and everything is just like working together and it's amazing slowly but surely we're getting there andrea have you had a chance <laughs> to watch that video that i sent you i did watch it yeah um so yeah it's nice to see things live on beyond your initial contribution so i'm glad it made a difference and i'm i'm curious to see what more we can do with it i would love for for us to uh, cuz you mentioned the linkedin uh, skills part right i don't think we ever touched on that uh, in terms of applying it but if we would be able to integrate that into crm that would be a game changer because as of right now, the only like skills are the skills that people filled in, right? Yeah. And some of them are not filling out the, the full capacity of what they're capable of. Yeah, and I'm meeting Bianca tomorrow morning um, to kind of catch up some more and to meet her in person. So like she can give me some of the details, you can give me some of the overview. I just came to listen and then we can catch up later. Nice. Sounds good. Good. Um, well, we've only got Isaac as a team lead in right now. Oh, I know where you, Isaac. Hi, uh, I'm doing okay. How's, um, how's your team going? How's patient forecasting? Are we still calling it that? I feel like that's the wrong name. Yeah, it's just like team task time series now. Time series, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, primarily now we, we got our poster finished um, for the upcoming workshop uh, at ICML. Um, oh, nice. Which was good. Um, and then, yeah, we're just, I kind of outlined kind of a roadmap that we're taking to like actually deploy some of our models to a production setting. So um, just kind of figuring out the steps necessary to perform robust evaluation, get like epidemiologist feedback, but then hopefully actually get models out for some counties, particularly in Florida and Texas, so people can see the actual like impacts and the projected case numbers, because those are like hot spots. so. Nice. Well, and, to and be fair, the whole of America seems like a hot spot right now. <laughs> not, not Unfortunately. To, not, to, not to prod, prod of that particular saw, but it's definitely having a bad time of it right now it's quite bad it's so frustrating it's so frustrating to watch from the outside but i can't say much britain's making an absolute hash of it so yeah we're about, uh, to, we're about to start a second wave of lockdowns in britain so isaac can you add the poster link to the daily doc yeah, um that would be yeah great, sure actually. yeah i can add it that'd be great is there anything you're um anything you need help with or is the team working as it is right now and anything else you need support on or anything like that um not too much i mean we do have kind of a 
long backlog of issues to work through, but we are working fairly efficiently. Um, also, I haven't heard too much from Surge lately, um, so we kind of could use uh, more epi people or um, I know he's busy, but if anyone has an additional epidemiologist somewhere. Um, yeah, we they're really, like they're like gold dust right now. In fact, they're they're what's what's rarer than gold dust? I mean, it's some decide some very Fairy rare dust? thing. <laughs> yeah, pixie <laughs> dust. Yeah, that's it. They're like pixie dust right now. Super rare. Um, yeah, they're really hard to get out of, obviously, because partially because they're so in demand across the entire globe. In yeah, for a second, I thought that there will be kind of like a, you know, the, the free up, right? After this uh, whole uh, psychological post-COVID mentality kicked in. And I thought that there will be this period of time where we will be finally able to attract a cohort of epidemiologists. But guess what? <laughs> Not happening. Well, th that's because... Um, all the people who are thinking it's all going fine are not epidemiologists. <laughs> They're all going, nope, still all on fire. Everything is still on fire. We need to definitely carry on trying to work out how to put this fire out rather than some people who would just stick their head in the sand and say, oh, it's nice and cool down here. Not really. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, I mean, we should still try and reach out to people that have epi. Um, um, didn't in, we have a recent? Didn't you? Didn't you do a call with a researcher recently? Doing some epidemiology. Well, Anu, right? But she's more like epidemiologist with a molecular biology angle. I feel like. But we can try. Uh, I don't know. I feel like we can't really be a beggar on this. We can't really be beggars and choosers in this such an hour when you kind of need all the points of view. We need to, yeah. We need to keep that cycle going. That's kind of the hardest. Problem right hey now Isaac, to quick question: Are uh, what is the kind of like uh, a, a thing that a researcher can look at? Is that the the actual graph result, or is that interactive tool? Um. So yeah. So the thing we're working on right now, uh, we worked on getting interpretability added to the models. So soon people should be able to see the features the models like attending to and what features it thinks are most important in forecasting COVID. Is it um, possible for you to share a screen just to, sh to show us at least some kind of like the, the visual of, uh, not like demo, but just like for, for us to understand how to approach uh, medical researchers in terms of, hey, we have X and it's like a chart or a graph or uh, like Power BI it's something. At this, and it's at this stage. And we need people to validate yeah. from this stage to the next stage. Because, you know, when, when we're just reaching out and saying, hey, we need epidemiologists, it's very, very hard to, to get any kind of attention. But if we're reaching out, hey, we need help with, you know, um, kind of validating the, the curve on this chart, uh, given, you know, these inputs or something like that, that'll be easier. Yeah, I can do that. Um... More of a digestible like use case user research rather than general can you get some help because that will go that makes some people not want to touch it because it's too because they feel like they're going to get some yeah and commitment is very you know big when like hey we need epidemiologists and immediately they're like oh no that's another 40 hours per week yeah okay yeah i can share some stuff i mean the big thing for us like uh so, so the, our, our end products are the kind of the model, but the idea is that the, like, um, the, the epidemiologists help verify the models working correctly, and also that, um, and also that I guess the um, that the it it makes sense in its forecast, so it's just not warning to do noise and stuff. So, what we have, and actually, I've. Rob, weights and biases before. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yeah, yeah, we um, can see it. We log all of our forecast results and all of our different model iterations to weights and biases. So um, the, the main thing is, for instance, like here's a model. It was trained on, this was trained, I think, for forecasting, oh, actually Colorado, for instance, Denver. So we have basically um, different stuff. This is like, 
the our forecast versus the actual over a two week period. That's for Denver, uh, right? Yeah, so this is for Denver County. Um, this is our relative confidence interval. Um, this, for instance, probably isn't one of our best models, but like for, uh, we, run, we run a lot of different things. But um, this shows kind of like our results versus the expected ones. Um, some of this is due to like noise. And so I think people will recognize that. So if, for instance, some days they report like all their yeah, cases. We, weekends, yeah, weekends kind of drop off and then Monday hits and the whole all the weekend yeah. cases get confirmed in one lump and it goes back to, you know, human patterns. But yeah, so, so is those... This, so is this, let me just quickly ask, is this model, so did you model on a chunk of data over a certain period of time and model the future and then the results came over the future or did you kind of pick the middle of the data, attempt to model and see how close to it was the, to the actual data you uh, had already been collected. So yeah, so the basically the model uh, was trained on a certain number of days. So for instance, like the, it's, we trained it on 60 free time steps. Then we tested on um, a certain number afterwards. So um, I don't know what exactly dates that oh, correspond to. Ninety-five. But yeah, but it, like look, but it pretty much. Uh, yeah, start trained for essentially two months worth of data. Then we forecasted on it. Uh, well, for another month, basically. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was the core of it. And then in some of our reports, we actually looked at what hyperparameters our model, um, like our model found the most useful. So like in, I think I already shared this, this on my LinkedIn, but this is yeah. our core model architecture and stuff. And then like in some of our sweeps, we could see that like for some counties, like a longer forecast history actually made it less accurate um, because it increased the error, which was kind of weird. A higher batch size, a bigger, larger batch size was reduced the error. Um, so, but these were the things, but then we, so these are like different results across counties, for instance. And so these are how these different parameters influence the final kind of loss. So, Obviously, here we actually want to reduce mean squared error. So the models that are best are essentially these ones down here. Um, but yeah, so and then so that's kind of what we we've been looking at. But where an epidemiologist comes in is like then looking at like um, we haven't integrated this into our core repo now, but looking at like kind of we do have reports, um, for instance of metrics of like what the model's looking at. So for instance, um, if we go back to like one of the sweeps, we pass in different bunches of features. So for here, we're using the model based on previous new cases, the month, the weekday, the mobility data for recreation. Is that Google mobility? Yeah, this is Google mobility data. So these are all the features that the model's using. And so are actually what Mike They were losing. Kind of, oh, what? You're back. Our, our, so yeah, so what Michael and Maggie, two people on my team are working on now is creating actual feature importance plots, which will show how much the model uses each feature in its forecast and how much they contribute to what the model's forecasting. So those in particular will be useful for epidemiologists because it will show in a sense the cause, causal factors that the model's learning and how it's learning it to for uh, in that sense it'll give it like the weight of the effect of it so this yeah. one has a very high weight this one has a low weight effect if, it, if i wanted to like use the like mathematical thing yeah yeah pretty much yeah it, it shows the importance or the model what the model thinks the importance of each feature is in in the forecast so obviously if the model then is a good model and it thinks it has a high feature importance, say to like mobility residential or something. And that would also seem to indicate that probably the mobility of residential data is an influencing factor in the number of, you know, infections. So in, in the infection rate changes in the, in the R basically. Yeah, yeah. So quick, quick question, like, and apologies, I've been gone for some time, but like, because you're doing these forecasts, like at a county level, like, um, how many actual like county public health officers are aware of this work? And yeah, like full stop, like how many county public health officers even know that this is, this exists and that you're doing this? 
Um, so yeah, we haven't really been in touch with any public health officials. I mean, we are trying to rigorously evaluate our models um, with both with our machine learning eval metrics and our epidemiologist surge. But yeah, we haven't yeah. actually been in touch yet. So I'm just yeah. I'm wondering out loud if it's an avenue to get their staff epidemiologist involved by like going to the county health departments, especially maybe some of the ones that are understaffed and say like, I agree. Hey, hey we'd like to help if we can. And then they may actually say like, like I'd like my personal epidemiologist to take a look at what you guys have. Um, that's a really good way of getting buy-in on a local level. Because then, I mean, I think the they, progress. Then they're going to bring something. private. No, they're going to bring the local knowledge into it as well, so it might improve each model as well. Right, because an epidemiologist from Illinois won't necessarily be able to validate what you're seeing in Denver, right? But like um, some of the models that are performing well, maybe actually reaching out to those counties to say, like, we have something that could be a benefit. We'd like you to take a look at it. Yeah, I, I mean, what you, just, what you just showed was really impressive. It just needs a little bit of packaging and voiceover to go and then take it to those different county health departments. Yeah, and the packaging needs, is important. Communication. Yeah, because like, um, right. Isaac, can you go back into the, the original chart of uh, the model? And uh, honestly, like when I look at it, I don't understand it. So maybe you can explain what it actually means from the perspective of like, policymakers, like what epidemiologist will be communicating based on this, assuming that this model is correct? Yeah, so I mean, uh, the, this chart is just the forecast of cases. Um, and this, I actually do have better ones that I could show you some over time. But this is just, these These are, so the, the orange here is kind of the new, the actual new case values. Um, for this particular uh, two-week period, our 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 like this blue line is our yeah, predicted yeah. values, and then basically this green area is the 95% confidence interval. So the model's 95% confident value should fall in here. Um, so like so yeah, for this particular one. So the value of this, uh, well, and it says days. Yeah, th this is days. So like, this is like, um, I do have the actual dates this started as parameters. But yeah, so this started, I think, May 30th. And this is May 30th, running all the way till June. Uh, well, it was whatever 15 days after that was. Is like, there a, a longer period? Um, we haven't tried doing a direct graph plot on more than 15 days out. Um, at this point, so our primary goal um, and our objectives, if like we go back to those, is to forecast 15 days out for specific counties. Is that um, I think the idea? I think the idea behind the 15 day I, is because cases right now are normally telling you what's happened two weeks ago. So if we can work out what's happening now, we'll find out where two weeks will will be. Because mm, you can't say four weeks because like there's going to be a two week effect lag you're not going to even know about what's going to affect that next two week lump because it's the you know the the evidence is looking like um people can be non non-symptomatic for two weeks obviously there's a chunk of people who are not symptomatic ever but yeah. the people who become symptomatic can have it for two up to two weeks before they become symptomatic so that two week yeah window, and the idea too the is... idea we're trying to get the idea before we know like the people who are getting it now but don't have symptoms, where are they going to land in that two week period? Well, yeah, and also, am I understanding that right? Yeah, well, and also the core value too is to like specifically inform like county officials and others like what steps they could take now to prepare. Like for instance, if our model like forecasts like two weeks from now a really high spike, then they can start like, they can start walking down now and then also loading up on like per personal protective equipment and planning like staffing things and if they have to like set up field hospitals or something they could prepare to do that or if they <clears throat> at the same time if it like forecasts a relatively low risk and stuff uh, or like relatively low case numbers um in case numbers going down then they could like maybe start to open up things you know with the proper protections and protocol i mean 
This would be a really interesting thing to actually test out of like what time horizon of forecast is useful for them at, from a policy perspective. Um, again, like I'm not a public health official, but somehow like the slowness of local governments makes me think that like two weeks might be too limited that like I may want a forecast that's four weeks out, actually. even if it has a much larger margin of error, just so that I have an idea of like, what are the, what are the possible scenarios for four weeks from now? Cause like the two weeks from now, like if I haven't already planned for it, I'm probably already in a bad place. Although already, it's- Yeah, the, so that, yeah. that ship has already sailed. Yeah. And we talked with uh, the LA County um, people here and it, I got the same feeling. We haven't been able to upload this call because of the, you know, the confidentiality and all things. I watched it. <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting listening. Um, basically, it, it what Andrea is, is saying is is I think is right, and we need to validate that with different counties. But I feel like there is a real demand for at least month uh, into the future forecasting. And my question is, I actually have two questions to Isaac. First one, how well the model generalizes across uh, completely different counties in terms of the like population density and, and other things that uh, you, I haven't seen you ingesting into the model. Uh, that's my first question. And the second question, if you have any examples of the, the prediction into the future based on these models. Um, so yeah, so basically right now, um, we're, 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 we're doing different things where we like take specific counties and we just fine tune the model to those specific counties, but we aren't explicitly incorporating uh, things like demographic data that is on our actual um, backlog list. Um, so like uh, to, to incorporate, as I said, actually before we do have kind of um, a long backlog, but definitely incorporating individual county level um, things to do is, is on it. So like, um, this is like our backlog. This is what we have nice. in progress. Um, but but that's like adding dem demographic and disease prevalence. We do want to add all these things like population, age groups, income level, density um, into the model because we think that could also particularly help improving positive transfer. Because if the model learns how to distinguish like between different counties, then like when we actually pass in different county data, it should be able to further fine tune. To a specific yeah. county better. Especially if you're dealing with giant counties like LA County. Um, technically yeah. LA is just like a city of cities and every city has its own demographics, income levels, you know, some some places yeah. are... Same as everywhere. Yeah, everywhere's got its own individual granularity to it. Uh, yeah, but you know, counties like LA yeah. is a completely different uh, beast. Um, and because no, it's got 10 million people in it. I'm aware of that. It's just the, the structure uh, of, yeah. uh, of it's, London's is London's exactly the same. London is a city of cities. It's not actually an individual. It's not, the way London is built is a city of cities. It's actually like little regional hubs and regional areas that are all like into it, it is like a city of cities or a city of regions to the point that Leeds, where I live, is actually one of the biggest individual city counties because London is actually like. 40 boroughs or something like that rather than one city and it acts yeah. and it is administered administered as lots and lots of small areas with some like more so let me ask side. you isaac on on this aspect what's the main blocker from integrating these uh various uh data points because it it does sound like a major priority at least from my perspective when i'm looking at this yeah. um yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the main thing is, is that uh, we were, uh, well, I mean, the, the biggest thing is, is that we're just kind of doing stuff incrementally here. So we're still running experiments with our current data and seeing like if we can, the kind of max performance we can extract on the current um, counties. And then that will also give us a better like idea if like actually adding this sort of data is actually improving performance. 
But um, do you think it's possible to fine tune a model on such a limited subset of uh, hyperparameters baked into it? Because you know it it may be random. Yeah, I've, I've, I mean that's it. Kind of goes back to we've discussed this many times, like complexity, interrelated system dynamics, and complexity starts to come into it. But if you are trying to accurately model and you only take 10 of the 100 parameters, yeah, you might be able to accurately model occasionally, but that occasional accuracy of your model might just be luck because you're not taking into account so much of the actual complexity going on, like demographics, like population density, and all these other income, you know, all these things that you have recognized are, are going to be factors. Can you really? No, could you really explain a model to someone without taking more of that into into account and consider it accurate? I don't know. Well, well I mean the idea. Was... Oh. Okay. No, I just Funny had idea. another comment. As I was listening to Isaac, it sounded like each of the individual county models were largely independent. And I was curious, like kind of how much immediate gain you might get by one, like trying to learn from all of the data in more of an aggregate way, but also to take into account proximity to other counties, right? Like LA County is next to Riverside County is next to, I forget what's mm -hmm. south of you guys. Um, but like in, in our area, our counties are somewhat smaller. And so like the grocery store I go to is actually in the next county over. And so like data from my county would actually help predict data in their county. And again, it depends on how much mobility there is among the people, how relevant it is. But it seems like by keeping the models independent, you may be making your job harder rather than having a universal model and then tailor for the local circumstance. Yeah, I mean, so there is definitely a correlation between different counties. Um, I mean, kind of with that too, I mean, we started with kind of less complexity and tried to build in more as we go on because uh, there are a, diff a lot of different configuration settings so I mean one of the first things we did was just we just didn't even use the the mobility data we just used new cases on the previous days and days of the weeks to forecast and we added mobility data and uh, actually for a while actually performance went down when we had it but once we got uh, our model better kind of tuned with the mobility data um, it started to go up so like everything we add is going to take a while for us to figure out like and make the relevant kind of architectural changes to the model to be able to handle it well um and stuff like that yeah so to um what, yeah and i was gonna ask like to what extent are you like injecting some amount of randomness or just kind of like a random walk simulation because like there's so much of the spread that's like, you know, one person lands on a plane, and goes to a birthday party and suddenly like you have a whole new cluster and like you could intentionally inject some simulation data into each of the models. I don't know, I'm just curious what you guys have been trying. It's, I like pre it's predicting for human stupidity or human randomness and it, you know, it's just it's only like, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, like, like when you provide like confidence intervals to an agency, like there should always like there's always some small percentage that your county is going to be the next one to explode, right? And so like the confidence interval, I could almost see like almost always has to have like some sort of a worst case scenario, unless like there's no like nobody can prevent their own county from being the next worst case scenario because it just takes one individual from outside the county to show yeah, up and the reality of this is that you know the world is not really a deterministic world and it's completely ergodic uh system which means you know the the measurement as a whole and the, there is this concept of measure theory like we we have to account for that otherwise you know the the kind of the statistical representation of data is almost meaningless unless we account for this randomness. And that randomness has to be not a typical kind of like million world simulation of statistics, but just uh, the actual like random walks within this uh, space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think for the most part, we're just trying to do our best to fit the model to 
like data that we already have and like and that that's that's part of the problem i mean with us having it here is obviously if we had like 10 years worth of data on various flus and yeah. pandemics like the model would be able to learn a lot better so that's where we were actually investigating some actual transfer learning to like we looked at like if we for instance collected data on um what was it on on other pandemics and then use that for pre-training so we were part of another backlog thing that we haven't gone around to though is like taking cases case data from MERS and SARS uh, and other pandemics and then like using that to pre-train the model um, but that that introduces new problems because some of those for uh, data is at the weekly level and of granularity other data is only at and in terms of geo resolution, it's only at the country or state level. So we don't have as fine grain data. Let me but. ask you, is it, is it possible within your team to break off kind of like Los Angeles County modeling into a specific sub team and connect, uh, like I can connect us with the uh, LA County CIO and basically attempt to get private data, attempt to get some participation from these people and just try to, you know, create a, a better model experiment or something? Um, I mean, yeah, we could definitely work with individual counties. I mean, ideally, we want to design a generalizable model that can be fine tuned to any county. So that's where we're kind of getting our overall architecture from. But uh, yeah, we, we can focus on like specific things too. And I think even just talking with someone in a county health official and seeing how they would actually maybe use our forecast would be useful. Yeah, I think the idea of generalizable model is the kind of a long term goal. But for, for us to build something generalized, we have to build something very specific. You need to, yeah, it's the paradox of specificity. You've got to build something really well specific and then work out what is generalizable from it afterwards. It's got to work well on a specific case before it can, you can say it works well in general. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And I mean, another thing we were looking at too is particularly my, when we integrate the demographic data is also might integrate like geospatial data too. So like potentially we're thinking of having like CNN or something taken like an image of the county or of the parts of the county and then like that would be created to take, like an embedding along with the demographic data mm -hmm. which would hopefully capture some of those like broader uh, categories and yeah stuff. kind of like ensemble of different uh models by domains not just by the uh you know importance yeah i mean yeah just fusing different kind of data points together using these different models and then incorporating them into like a general architecture so um yeah that's kind of what we were thinking okay so let me uh try to kick off that conversation with the cio of la county and maybe we can form a you know kind of a task team or like strike team um within your team or add new people to add because there are a lot of people that recently joined that are interested in visual visualizations of the uh, forecasting so maybe we can assemble a team out of new people uh, to focus on this subset there's potentially some other brainstorming around like the earliest leading indicators that might be useful so i'm thinking about like like in communities where people are shopping for masks, hopefully like once they arrive in the mail, they actually intend to wear them, right? So like, could you use as like a, you know, seven day precursor, like how many Google searches or how many Amazon searches are being done for protective products, right? Assuming that when they arrive, that person's actually gonna use them. And like, what's the penetration of those searches per capita? Like, it would be really interesting just to like, think through like what are the other like leading edge indicators that might give me some idea of what's going to happen seven to almost 14 like days the, from now like on the human behavior side uh, almost like yeah is it like the sociological patterns that are happening within you know exactly the shopping patterns because if people are starting to shop it means they're getting a judgment that goes oh the cases are getting worse here or it feel it's starting to feel like it or same as Protus, like you know, in, in US, like Twitter, Twitter is the best, you know, uh, leading indicator of all kinds of things that we're observing uh, right now. 
and the network effect yeah yep the the ensemble of all these uh, different factors may be the only solution to reduce uncertainty about this uh, you know model in a way yeah um yeah i mean there's lots of different data sources we could integrate i mean that's kind of why we spun off also like a specific sub just focused on uh, data engineering and ingesting all these different data sources because also another big thing is just we struggled with for a while was our architecture because we have different data and if we're forecasting on a daily basis it needs to all be joined together and persisted daily um, so that that's also slowed down some of our stuff just getting that infrastructure in place yeah okay well, this is exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you jumped on the call today and gave us this. I, I would call it short demo, right? Because yeah. you've actually gone through all of this stuff. Impromptu um, and explained it, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, there are many things that we discussed. Uh, just to follow up actions, I'll reach out to the contacts at LA County. We should assemble uh, a list of different counties and corresponding, uh, like, um, people responsible for communication and just send them some form of material that, hey, this is what we're doing and we may benefit from, you know, collaboration with you, especially if you're understaffed and you may benefit from our vast network of data scientists. And yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, that sounds good. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, yeah, we were also thinking in surge recommended I mean, really studying like to like the effects of like masking policy. So well, we're looking at like if we can find data to on um, specific counties, like if you institute a mask order, like what's the quantifiable like difference in cases and how does the model predict that? Um, you so can I think just look at Czech Republic on that one because they made it legally mandated for public spaces to everyone to have masks. So you could always look at what how that effect was in Czech Republic and use because Yes, American society is not the same as Czech Republic society, but still, you might see some human patterns in there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, anyways, that's kind of, I hope that gives a good overview of like our process and what we're doing, um, so. I've definitely got a better idea of what you're doing. I've known bits of it, but I've not, uh, yeah, just not having a visualization of it sometimes. You've, you've always been talking about models and I'm like, is it still all just like theoretical mathematical models right now? Or has it got anything that's something that we can digest yeah, and easier? I, yeah, I mean, we do have a list, our list of specific objectives here. So like here it was, we, for coronavirus, it was to develop these general models, to study them, to use the transmission dynamics, um, create kind of the central data lake for other people to use, etc. cetera. Um, from like, yeah, more of a machine learning perspective, we were looking at few shot forecasting techniques, whereas that's kind of what our workshop paper was and our report on transmission. Um, so yeah, these are kind of like, I did want to highlight, we do have like this concise thing on like how we're providing valuable and looking at our deliverables, so. Um, yeah, and the, the other piece, I'll, I'll just send a, a, an article, a brief article to uh, go more in depth in what I meant by you know, ergodic versus non-ergodic uh, systems, because, you know, I think that is very important to the context of this task, because, you know, we're making a lot of assumptions whether, you know, the, the system that we're trying to model is ergodic or not, and whether the system is actually like human system or that's an, a nature system that we're modeling for. Okay, yeah, that definitely um, makes sense. And I mean, I do think like actually, uh, pre-training and like getting more 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 like time series models that can extract general temporal patterns which has been a area of research for mine because like if we like if a model like is fine pre-trained on even unrelated data but then it learns to like search for general temporal patterns and then you fine tune it on the, the additional layers to say covid or some other pandemic i think that should also help like it to like figure out the best way to forecast because then it has that like pre-built kind of prior of knowledge and even though yeah. it might not be the exact same case it should like enable it to learn better so yeah. um, i think 
like thinking outside of this domain too to find some other things that may be relevant. Like when Arthur is talking about like natural processes, it made me think of seed dispersal. And like, you know, I saw some TED talk like years ago about, you know, like how does seed dispersal work? And like most of them fall very close to the original tree, but occasionally one gets carried on an air current and goes really far away. And like in some ways, this viral transmission may have similarities to that. It's just like the first one that came to mind. But if you're looking for other training data, maybe there are some of these other natural processes to Yeah, to the, the patterns, because what essentially the the model is a, a search for mo uh, for a search for um, patterns and some pattern recognition. Essentially, system, yeah. it it, um, it it might be a good idea to explore different patterns that exist and different uh, statistical data that we have, the observable patterns uh, and also conceptual patterns because some of the things are not observable by nature. I mean, they are, but we cannot produce any objective data about them. So yeah, maybe ex expanding models with some of these concepts would be also a beneficial thing, but sounds like a long-term effort. Yeah, well, well, actually, some of the things we were di directly studying and I studied in that report was pre-training specifically on river flow data because I'd used a lot before to like forecast how streams like stream flow using neural nets before. So, um, and that actually did improve performance. Like if you go back to the original report, pre-training on river flow data, even though it's in many ways not at all related to COVID, it's similar because you have different rivers You'd think when it rains, the river would go up, but really there's all kinds of time lags and similar things between that and things like soil moisture and other stuff that affect, that actually affect the actual like increase. So actually training on, pre-training on that did seem to improve performance based on what I saw in those experiments and what I highlighted in that report. So, um, so, that, so that's one. Yeah, that's is, that's super sounds cool. like a clever way of approaching it to think about yeah, what what else in nature has time lags and complex interacting poly, you know what what else has yeah, complex interactions and things like yeah, rain patterns and how that affects rivers is a really good example of it. So good good shot. Um Okay, right. yeah. I'll I'll have to jump off because I have a call within around ten minutes and <laughs> I need to eat something. <laughs> okay, yeah. It went, for, it went for fifty minutes, but it was really interesting and hopefully, you know, it's sometimes I like the impromptu calls where I like I learn a little bit more about what one team's doing. Yeah. So it was you, awesome. Uh, Isaac. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. No problem. Yeah, let me know how it goes with reaching out or maybe yep. CC me or something. Sounds good. I will. Okay. Well I'll see everybody. Um if anybody's got any quick questions before we wrap up. But then I for ask the questions for Isaac because I think we've we've beat that out of him now. He needs, he needs a rest. Yeah. Now, just just one for my for my side. I'll start my video. I, I popped it up in I think in general as well. That um, there is there are two two demands for translations very practically, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking for a way to reach out to team leaders or people coordinating stuff that might inform me as a temporary lead about the possible need for translations and that could pertain to communication material, external, or uh, maybe um, scientific papers that might be useful. Uh, I think it was Anton who came up with such demand. So for a way. Yeah, I think to... there's, a, there's a chunk of data that's in French somewhere. I can't remember which data sets yeah. are in French. There's a, definitely a chunk of data that exists that's in French. And obviously, um, originally, uh, the Allen Institute came to us asking for translations and there were Chinese, did, you know, Chinese documents and Chinese research to yeah, translate the first, that. The, the first step, I think, is to ask, to be able to ask the, the coordinators, people who are dealing with um, things that might be in need of translation, if they need translations, it could be I think the, the best person to ask for, for what's in data and what he's doing is probably Slava because he's obviously running the ingestion of most of the data. If he's ingesting from a place that he knows it's got a lot of French in it, for example, 
if it could work out to tag them things as French and then in the data lake they could link up people who want to translate and go, well, if you look at this tag, these are all things that are in French and we can't currently digest Clear, because like. they're in a different language. Yeah. Clear, so, but that, that's then about terms, but about whole papers, that's, that's another stuff. So my question- no, I'm, on about, I'm on about tagging it as in French because it's the whole thing's in French. Yeah, so again, my question was how to be able to ask all the coordinators if they be, are able to assess their translation needs and to have a, a picture then of that, an overview, be able to decide if we need to partner up with, for instance, pros.com to get regularly translation services from them on a voluntary basis. Um, I'll have to wait until I catch Slava next time. Or you can reach out to Slava and ask him because... I will, I, will, I will ask him. But I think yeah, he will only have an have aspect it. few on it uh, pertaining to uh, terms in, in, in data uh, collections and not in, in the paper domain. But okay, I will reach out to him. I'll ask him. Might be the best person yeah. to ask right now. Yeah. Good. So if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're trying to assess like what is the collective demand for translation exactly. yep. in general? Um, and generally translation into English, I imagine. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then have you been hearing that this has been a bottleneck on certain processes or like what got you interested in trying to assess the demand? I'm able to uh, reach out to the founder of pros.com, which is the, tra the largest uh, translators community and marketplace. Oh, okay. And okay, so you have I'm a connection translator with myself. I'm not translator myself. I just, I just want to assess indeed if such a need is there. And Anton responded to it. And Daniel was also saying, yeah, I, I have some documents that might be in need. I only want to assess if there's a, a structural need and then attend to it or otherwise let it go. That, that's all. Okay. okay, so you've got a lead on a good supplier in case it's something that's needed. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to Put, I wanted to put out uh, a question in, in the coordinators uh, channel, but that, that seemed dormant already for uh, for um, a month. So that's why. Yeah, it's been months. Like the most of the coordinators are in operations, for the most part. Operations. Okay. I, like want to, a, I want to drop a message over there. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, that's where most of the coordinators are, or most of the team leads, just about. I'll make sure that I'll, we've got a few more team leads now because there's more teams. Because let's be fair, there's always more teams. It's a constant process. Um, I'll make sure I, I'll I'll make sure I add um, team leads into there as well. Yeah. Okay. Clear. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anyways, um, thanks everybody for coming and talking and uh, discussing and thank you Isaac for your very useful and very um, informative explanation about what you've been doing with a bit more details. Hi Andrea, nice to see you again. Hi Max and Boris. Have you guys got anything before we wrap up? Boris, are you okay? Anything, do you need anything? <laughs> Have you got any, any questions before we wrap up? I'll take that as a no. Have a good uh, have a good weekend, guys. Yeah. And, uh, Hi, everyone. I'll, uh, I'll see you around and uh, sure. Happy hunting. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs>